Namaste. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Lopa Mutra Goswami, and I'm an Indian researcher, currently doing my PhD at Griffith University in Australia. Um, I've been doing um, research with Indian surrogate mothers since 2014, and I'll be talking to you about uh, some of the perspectives uh, from the surrogate mother's perspective. Um, also, I'll be using uh, the term surrogate mother because that's how Indian surrogates would like to be uh, called. Um, I didn't realize that that would be um, something of significance until I heard Erica yesterday who preferred not being called a surrogate mother. So I think uh, it is important that I tell you why I'm referring to surrogate mothers in India as surrogate mothers. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in, uh, in a little while. Um, before I begin, I'll have to um, acknowledge my mentor, Dr. Karen smith Rotabi. She isn't here today, but it's only because of her that uh, both these research have been possible. And um, also, uh, the cover of uh, the image that you see is the cover of a book uh, by Karen and Nicole, where I have a book chapter uh, also talking about the perspectives of Indian surrogate mothers. Um, just to give you, a, I give you an idea about India, because this is going to be quite significant when we talk about certain things, uh, the population of India is 1.3 billion people, and uh, compared to the world population, which is 7.53 billion. Um, also, um, the number of people under poverty line as of 2011-12 um, uh, census is 269 million, which is about 21.9% of the population. And when we talk about people living below the poverty line, we're talking about about 308 uh, British pounds uh, per year for a household of people, or roughly around 390 US dollars per year. Um, surrogacy in India. Now, um, India has been the <coughs> capital of international surrogacy, uh, international gestational surrogacy until 2016 when we banned international gestational surrogacy um, and we legalized surrogacy back in 2002. Uh, most of the academic papers, about 90% of it, comes from uh, the Indian diaspora as well. Um, with the current ban, however, you would question as to is this a real ban or how long will it stay around for, uh, keeping in mind the kind of investment that has gone into the surrogacy market in India. Um, we don't know what is the exact number of surrogate births uh, due to the unregulated nature of the market there. Also, uh, we estimate about between 400 million to a billion US dollars per year that was generated <coughs> Uh, by surrogacy, uh, due to surrogacy arrangements in India. Now, it's quite interesting as to why did India become this hub for surrogacy. And these are some of the reasons uh, that we'll quickly go through. Uh, lack of surrogate mothers in the p intending parents or the commissioning parents' uh, country of origin. Um, I was just talking to somebody here from Israel yesterday as well, and uh, you know we were talking about how probably uh, you know we don't have as many surrogate mothers or women willing to be surrogate mothers in that country. Uh, comparatively lower costs. You just notice um, in the previous slide that yeah, uh, if you notice in the last bit, it's only about a third of the amount uh, that you pay in uh, countries such as the U.S. or, uh, or such, such as the U.S. Um, legislative issues um, uh, around the world as well, and uh, in India, there's always a way where you can find a loophole and work around it, so oftentimes people come in, uh, you know, uh, use that. Um, also, India is pretty known for its cutting-edge medical technology, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, no secret that some of the best doctors in the world are also from India. So I think that's another reason why uh, people come into India to, um, uh, you know, commission surrogacy arrangements. Also, uh, India actually invested a lot in marketing itself as the surrogacy hotspot. So with about 3,000 fertility clinics around the country, and this is only the number of registered surrogacy clinics around the country. Um, also, um, a lot of uh, surrogate women, uh, uh, a lot of women who have been surrogates in India actually have taken this as an accepted way of uh, 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 you know, uh, earning money as against anything else that they were doing, like, for example, working in a sweatshop, and uh, it gave them 
a bump of, for example, whatever money they would gather with a job as a factory worker or a, um, or a domestic helper, uh, it would take them 10 years to gather the amount of money that they would gain from uh, you know, nine months of investment in, uh, uh, in a surrogacy arrangement. Also, um, a lot of, uh, there was a lot of uh, Western interest um, uh, in Indian surrogates. Uh, due to uh, the cultural background in India, Indian women are known, uh, uh, or in that those uh, socioeconomic status, known to not use alcohol or drugs. So it sort of made them the perfect uh, mother to raise uh, surrogate babies, and it uh, it reduced the risks by a large extent. And also, um, it made uh, them a perfect mother worker. While they would take care of the surrogate child, also there was no legislation that helped them or, or they couldn't afford to keep this child after it was born. So it was almost like a perfect uh, you know, solution that they will raise the child uh, perfectly and they'd also be sort of, in a way, uh, you know, uh, they don't have any option but to give away the child as well. This is, uh, uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick uh, uh, you know, uh, understanding of our first field visit, which was in 2014. Um, the basic idea that we went in was to understand, there was a lot of, uh, sorry, uh, there was a lot of um, discussion and debate around uh, whether Indian surrogates were being coerced or was there exploitation going on uh, at this point in time. So we went in and actually asked the surrogate mothers and uh, tried to see what their understanding of uh, uh, exploitation was and if or not they felt exploited at all. Uh, into, um, I interviewed about 25 um, surrogates uh, between the age group of 26 and 45. Um, their monthly income was between 2,000 to about 25,000 rupees, both uh, partners put together. Uh, you can see the uh, dollar equivalent of that. Uh, and uh, the educational level of these women were anything from being illiterate to about second year of um, college. Um, marital status is two of them were widowed, three of them were divorced, and 20 of them were in uh, marital uh, situations. So one of the questions was, why did you choose to become a surrogate? And uh, these were some of the reasons that they gave us. Uh, to buy a house, to provide food for the family. They didn't have a job. They were a single parent. Um, to provide better education to their children. To pay rent. To save up for their daughter's wedding. Uh, pay, pay off debt. Win-win. Uh, and it was a gift of a child that they were giving to a childless couple. So you can see the spectrum of responses here from being absolute financial, where they really just needed the money, to also altruistic, where they actually wanted to give um, a child to a childless couple. I'll, I'll expand a little bit in some of the, uh, about some of the responses here. When you talk about providing food for the family, one incident, or one of the interviews that struck to me was when she said, um, I used to beat up my kids every night so that they would get tired and go to sleep because I didn't have food to provide at the table. So this is the level of poverty we are talking about uh, when you say there's no food to provide. Um, also, uh, uh, so this research was conducted in Gujarat in India uh, and uh, getting your daughter married is a big uh, uh, yeah, dowry is still prevalent there, for example. So you almost start saving up as soon as you have a female child born into the family. Um, um, and in a lot of cases, there's also a lot of female infanticide and things like that, which is decreasing. Um, let me tell you about that. So, um, but yeah, so uh, you see when I say why are they becoming a surrogate? So it's not just... Uh, you know, for a money for money to buy myself jewelry or whatever, but it's actually to put food on the table. And uh, one of them also said, um, I mean, uh, we all we are all aware of this already, where surrogacy is very often also compared to um, sex work. And uh, as soon as I went in, oftentimes you would hear them saying, like, uh, at least I'm uh, I'm not selling my body. Uh, I'm doing this where there is no sex involved, and uh, you know, I'm doing this for my family. Um, uh, also, when you talk about win-win, uh, this is very interesting. When they said, I need, the, I need the money and they need a child, 
and this is, you know, uh, this, this works perfectly. So uh, they're giving me what I need and I'm giving them what they need, right? Um, another question we asked was, how did you feel when you handed over the baby? Now, this was a mixed bag because uh, while some of them, um, uh, well, very few of them said, I didn't feel anything. Uh, my interest was only with the money, but sometimes, of course, I think of them and hence those commissioning parents can still call me. I ask for their photographs and they agree, right? Now, this is a very rare situation, whereas most often they said um, something like, I would feel happy, uh, but also I remember those kids um, or I miss them or I wish that the commissioning parents did keep in touch with me or I wish I had photographs from them, right? Um, some of them also said, uh, I cry. I cried for days. Um, you know, I, I remember the child for, for a very long time. Um, and uh, uh, the situations varied between some commissioning parents keeping in touch with these pair, uh, with the surrogate mother, whereas some who uh, had a clear um, uh, cutoff from them as well. Um, this was what uh, was the main and goal of our research. Do you feel like you were taken advantage of or used unfairly in your, uh, in your surrogacy experience? These are some of the quotes. Um, no, I'm looking at the green one. No, uh, why will they take advantage? They haven't asked me to become a surrogate. It was my situation which pushed me into becoming a surrogate. I went there by myself. I thought if someone else benefits, only then I will benefit. Uh, they have no advantage here. It's good work as someone got a child and our poverty also got erased. I'll quickly look at the blue one, um, top right. No, nothing like that. We came here at our own will. No one pulls us here. We also have some problems, so we come here on our own. No one is taking any advantage. We go out on our own to the hospital, tell madam, who's the doctor, that we want to be a surrogate, and if she feels that we can be taken in, only then she will agree. We have to be uh, married, should have our own kids, have to show their pictures, etc., and only then she will take us in. If there is any problem, she, will then, she then refuses. Right? Next, we went in uh, for a second time in 2016, and this time uh, we went in right after the ban was introduced, um, and we went in to talk to women who lived in that same community but had not been surrogate mothers. And when we went in with this perspective, we were basically trying to figure out why, it, whilst living in the same community, uh, have these mothers not engaged in surrogacy? And if there was some information that they knew of that the surrogate mothers themselves were not telling us. For example, something like um, uh, you know, mother, uh, mortality rates, where there are a lot of surrogate mothers who are um, you know, dying during childbirth. Uh, you know, and then we weren't being informed about this by the surrogate mothers. So we just tried to get a taste of that. Again, I interviewed about 25 non-surrogate mothers. And... Um, uh, this was in December, whereas the ban was introduced in, um, in August. These are some of the profiles. So just to give you an idea, the women range from the age group of between 22 to 45. And uh, again, their education levels were between being illiterate to uh, having a master's degree as well. Um, these were some of the points of significance. Uh, we were trying to figure out what was their reason, uh, if they, uh, you know, uh, why have they chosen not to be a surrogate, and if they wanted to be a surrogate, why would they, under what circumstances would they be a surrogate? Um, and uh, we also uh, looked at what was their opinion on the current ban that was introduced, which is what I'll talk to you about um, uh, in a bit. Um, to just give you an idea of why they hadn't been surrogates, uh, what they responded was that uh, they didn't need the money. Uh, some of them also talked about uh, it being a taboo in their community, and so they didn't want to engage in this unless they really needed to. Uh, they also spoke about um, um, uh, if uh, they would, if possibly in the future they needed that kind of money. And uh, also, uh, I think... A few of them spoke of they didn't know what they would say to their child when they grew up as to 
what they were doing with this pregnancy and why were they giving away the child um, to somebody else. So uh, what is their opinion on the current ban? Now, um, I mean, just to give you an idea, the whole point of my presentation is to present to you what these women are wanting to tell us instead of what we want to speak for them. So it's basically to have an idea of what they really want for themselves and to give them the agency and hear their voice. Uh, what these women spoke of about the current ban was that it's really good for us people, as in uh, surrogacy is really good for us poor people. Surrogacy is really good. I don't understand why they have banned this. We can't earn as much in a year otherwise, for, uh, which is five to six lakhs um, in Indian rupee. Uh, it should continue for, poor, for a poor person. They get a place of shelter and everything. It is good for them. It shouldn't have happened. They are not able to become surrogates. This is bad. Surrogacy has to be there for outsiders too because majority of these parties are good. They pay the surrogates well and more people come from there. And this is why it should be there. So the current situation in India is that we have banned international commercial surrogacy. Uh, and... Um, uh, the only form of surrogacy that exists in India right now is domestic altruistic surrogacy. But it also often uh, um, brings us to question, um, is this really going to be altruistic surrogacy? I was having a discussion yesterday at dinner where I was telling them that um, um, her and I can be sisters uh, or you know cousins in India. You can establish that saying, you know, I, she is my somebody, 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 somebody. And that's how, uh, you know, she can be, or I can be a surrogate for her. Uh, this is also seen in, um, the, uh, uh, in organ transplant in India, uh, in kidney donation, for example. Um, and I have known somebody personally who has done this, where they've changed documentation and then actually uh, look, uh, portrayed somebody to be a relative uh, uh, in order to be able to take their uh, kidney. Um, in the past. Um, this was a discussion that uh, uh, came in yesterday about the feminist discourse. Uh, as far as surrogacy is concerned, it's very split, even in, um, uh, uh, amongst feminists. Some people talk about uh, it being a basic abomination of all possible uh, human rights, whereas um, others talk about it giving agency to the woman and actually her being able to make decisions for herself as well. Um, in the Indian context, though, you have to be very careful uh, because sometimes a lot of other things are um, going on. Uh, you have to check whether she's been coerced, whether she uh, is doing it at her own, on her own will. So these are all different things that you really need to look into. Uh, we have uh, this particular medical practitioner, I don't know if you've heard of her, Dr. Nena Patel, and uh, she has developed a model in India, in Gujarat, where... Um, it's, it's very difficult for you to question that because she's under the limelight, so she tries her best to keep it as uh, transparent and um, as transparent as possible. But, but, but then again, going back to the fact that there's a lot of unregulated uh, <coughs> clinics around, and so uh, you, know, you really don't know what they're uh, doing. For instance, um, um, embryo reduction uh, you know, or informed consent, oftentimes when I've spoken to uh, you know, surrogate mothers who are not a part of uh, um, Dr. Patel's clinic. Uh, they're barely aware of what, uh, what, the, what is the procedure that they're really signing up for. Or uh, if there's been a, a, fe uh, a fetal reduction, they go in and they say, we did a procedure and we came back. They really don't know what goes into the nitty gritties of it, right? Um, this was something as well that uh, caught my attention yesterday um, in the discussion. Uh, is a shifting trend in terminologies. Um, I noticed that um, uh, people from South Africa and also uh, from India, we use the terms commissioning parents and surrogate mother more commonly. Uh, whereas, um, you know, uh, people from the US and UK are potentially using the term intending parents. Um, and uh, surrogate or car carrier, um, uh, it, it just brings me to question, um, are we trying to distance the surrogate mother from this procedure and uh, be, be more, um, uh, how do I say that? 
um, I'm losing the word, but uh, be more favorable towards the intending parents, for example. I mean, I'm, it's just a question I'm putting out there. And are there really cultural differences? For example, uh, when I heard Erica yesterday, uh, it, it struck me, and I, and I think, uh, you know, she's completely right in, uh, you know, telling us that she does not want to be associated with the word mother in this context. Whereas um, in India, it is quite different because uh, the concept of blood is very important. So in every uh, uh, interview that I've had with surrogate mothers, they've almost always said that, of course, that is our child. I mean, I know it's not my child, but uh, I've shared blood with this child. So uh, I am also the mother. Whereas when uh, Susan was presenting, uh, also uh, when Visanti was presenting, it's very interesting that, uh, you know, uh, it, there is no confusion that the intending parents are the real parents. Whereas from the surrogate mother's perspective in a developing country like India, they're actually thinking or even reporting something like, I hope someday the child will come back and, uh, you know, find me or, uh, you know, um, you, I mean, or they'll, they'll want to know who I am, right? Uh, this brings me to, yeah, my current PhD research. After being in the field uh, for this many years and talking to surrogate mothers, um, um, I decided to go on the route of a PhD and uh, look at surrogate mothers and uh, their mental health issues. I'm currently trying to define uh, whether it's mental health or psychosocial, uh, you know, you know, y'all can help me with that as well. Uh, there is uh, uh, no provision for psychological screening or legal counseling for surrogates in India. Um, uh, there is uh, oftentimes, uh, I mean, it's, on, it's there on paper, of course. Uh, however, uh, if she's physically capable, uh, she gets in. Uh, there is no uh, mental health uh, assessment that is really conducted uh, because there is no psychologist, uh, you know, who is there uh, assessing the person. So it's the medical doctor who actually, just by merely having a chat with her, tries to get an understanding of her mental health uh, uh, status before engaging in a surrogacy uh, uh, in arrangement. Um, uh, this is just, uh, uh, you know, from uh, literature. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of demand, um, you know, on the part of the surrogate mother. It requires a huge amount of uh, maturity and uh, also healthy adjustment. Women who, there's, uh, you know, evidence that women who relinquish a child are at a greater risk of postnatal depression, including feelings of anger and guilt. Depression along with other psychological problems, such as feelings of guilt, regret, and loss can emerge after giving birth. Uh, surrogate mothers have indicated that they would keep the child if commissioning parents um, or doctors uh, refuse to take care of the child. Uh, this has been uh, true in uh, a few situations in India where uh, surrogate babies have been born and uh, parents uh, coming in from different parts of the world have not been able to get an, uh, a passport for these kids to leave um, India. Uh, so, for example, uh, one of the surrogate mothers who had... Um, uh, Japanese twins um, was uh, mentioning that she had them for three months in her house and uh, uh, she was dressing them up in Indian attires and uh, you know and she was also saying that oh they didn't even look uh, Japanese any longer uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, I think what she was trying to say is that uh, you know but uh, she was very happy to have them as well and obviously there was uh, monetary help uh, from the parents, uh, you know, to take care of these child, and she wouldn't be able to take care of these two extra kids along with her other children as well. But uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is that if nobody else will, they will keep the child. Um, uh, I mean, at least this is a situation in India. Um, surrogate mothers develop strong emotional ties with the child, and separation leads to an overwhelming sense of loss and an emotionally stressful phase for the surrogate mother. Um, you know, like, like you saw in some of the um, quotes that I've uh, put up, uh, they, they do miss their children and they would like to have some sort of connection with these children as well. Um, gap in literature, very little is known about the mental health impact of surrogacy, that sur uh, of surrogacy on surrogate mothers, uh, especially transnational gestational surrogacy practice, uh, and specifically in India has been under-researched. Uh, and there's long term ev uh, there's, uh, evidence of long term psychological impact on the surrogate mother in the form of postnatal depression or psychosis, but very few studies have actually examined them. 
people have mentioned about it uh, without uh, empirical uh, evidence to back it up. And with evidence supporting surrogate mothers' experience of psychological issues uh, post-child relinquishment, it is important to gain further understanding of this uh, particular phenomenon. And so this brings me to my, uh, I mean, this is going to be my research, and hopefully you'll hear from me in a in a few years or in a year, and I'll talk to you and report my evidence from my PhD work. Um, also conclude by saying that while uh, Indian surrogacy did require a revamping and, uh, you know, uh, re-look into it, but a complete ban of it, uh, I'm not too sure if it was really necessary. Regulation, yes, but ban, I'm not too sure. Again, coming from the perspective of the surrogate mothers, when they say, when they say that this was a great option for us to have. Namaste. Thank you.